so in this video I'm going to take a look at the 34 key layout that I came up with when I switched to the Ferris Sweep uh, from the 36 key layout that I was using with my Gergoplex. So that layout was based on the idea of uh, toggleable layers. So previously I was having a layer switch where you hold down a layer thumb key and then you're in that layer just while you're holding that down. But I wanted to try and avoid that kind of extra cording as a result of using layers. So I came up with a, a layout that's based on the idea of toggling into a layer so it stays in the layer once you activate it. You haven't got to hold anything down. And this layout uses that principle as well. So 34 or fewer key layouts are actually interesting because when you build them with one of these microcontrollers you actually don't need to use diodes, you don't need to create a matrix for the connections from the key switches to the microcontroller. So they're very easy to, to work with and the PCBs are very simple uh, if you're soldering it from scratch. So I'm definitely not saying that 34 keys are some kind of holy grail layout here. I think there's a there's a point on people's journeys there where you, you're interested in a, a particular layout because either you've got your eye on a particular keyboard and you're, you're interested in going to that level or you're kind of pursuing, you know, reducing finger movement as I have been. Uh, so this is just, you know, focusing on the 34 key layout, which happens to be the Ferris layout as well. I'm actually also currently exploring a 24 key layout, which I'll be doing another video on as well. So uh, we're not done yet on uh, on taking keys away. So how much effort is it actually to live with a 34 key layout as a daily driver? It was surprisingly little, you know, I was quite pleased with the sort of the simpler form with the thumb, you know, you haven't got to worry about which thumb. I often did find myself kind of using the wrong thumb key. It's a little bit confusing, especially if you're working with layers, uh, you know, just reducing that down to two makes it simpler. You know, you've got your home thumb position and then another one. You haven't got to remember which way you're going for that other one, it's just the other key. So from your home position on the thumbs, you've got one more key and that is really appealing. So basically, I'm using this layout with my Mac and the iPad and I'm mainly programming in Vim with it so I'm not going to get too detailed onto Vim here I want to keep this kind of useful for everybody but I will do more detail in another video on Vim at some stage. So firstly the layout I'm using uh, for the actual keys is ISRT so I switched to that soon after going down the Colmac route and it seems like a very logical progression from Colmac uh, it was very easy to pick up after learning Colmac uh, but definitely offers loads of advantages for me at least over Colmac so I was really pleased to, to have gone down that road so with my 36 key layout I managed actually Actually without using home row mods. The few times I tried home row mods I had all kinds of issues, you know, it was it was triggering the shift version on when I was rolling and I was, I was firing the keyboard shortcuts just as I was typing and that was because of the roll effect when you type. You often overlap so you haven't released the first key by the time you hit the second one. Uh, if you don't set up home row mods in the right way then that causes all kinds of chaos. So because of that reason I'd actually shied away from them but with a 34 key layout I'm kind of forced to confront this and, and, and jump in because uh, without that I think it would be a real effort. So with this layout I'm keeping a dedicated shift key and that solves one of the big issues I had with the home row mods in that you know when you use shift in fast typing to make the first ca uh, first letter of a word capital you actually often roll from shift to the letter in exactly the same way you would roll if you were just typing that the original letter on the home row and then the next letter. So there's really no way the keyboard can tell if you're shifting or just rolling between the two characters. So by keeping the shift key separate we're not putting shift on the home row mods uh, that actually just solves that problem. Now I'm also taking that principle and using it with the control key because when I'm using Vim I'm often holding down control key and it's one of these few times when I'm actually left holding a key down to use as a modifier so I'm holding control down and then I'm using the Vim shortcuts to do things like go up and down the the document and interestingly the keys to do that are on ISRT at least um, on alternate hands so with the control key on the thumb you can keep that held down and do alternate hands if you want to move up and down. So uh, again, keeping the control key in this case and the shift key as dedicated keys kind of solves a lot of the issues that would have happened if I'd gone to the full home row mod arrangement. So there's another advantage to keeping a dedicated thumb shift key and a dedicated thumb control key. And that is when they can have this sort of sticky behavior. And that means you can just tap it and then the following key that you hit will be the shifted or the control version of that key. You haven't got to hold it down for that to happen. So that reduces fatigue again. You know, you can just tap it and hit the next one or even roll or hold it down in the normal way. It all works. So just a, a, it gives you a bit more flexibility to do things a bit sloppier, a bit faster. So with Command and Alt on the home row modifiers, the way I found to make sure that doesn't impact your normal fast typing, especially with rolling, um, is to make sure there's a minimum delay that you need to hold down that key before it fires as the modifier. So you have to pause when you use these as modifiers, but that's okay. I you know I was coming from tap dance for my all of my command keys. I pretty much put the command version of every letter on the tap dance hold function for each key. So I don't mind a little pause. That I actually found that quite quite a good way of working with it. Usually when you're firing a command keyboard shortcut on a Mac, it feels a little bit of a more of a deliberate action. It's not in amongst lots of rapid 
rapid key presses. So I uh, definitely don't mind that. And it keeps them from interfering with the roll behavior when you're fast typing over those keys. So things like backspace, tab, escape, and enter are all on the second layer. And you get into the second layer with a quick tap on the right thumb. So single tap, then you can roll on to enter. And that sort of double tap for enter seems, you know, you get used to that really quickly. And same with backspace. And of course, once you're in that second layer, it doesn't come back out even when you're not holding the thumb key down. So you can repeatably hit backspace if you need to do that. Um, and in that layer, I've got a dedicated alt key for things like alt backspace as well. So from that second layer, we can get back to our home layer just with the left thumb key. And this is exactly the same in all of the other layers. So basically, whatever, if you get lost, you can just hit that and you know you'll be in, in the first layer. Now, I've come up with a way of doing this in a way that doesn't issue with the space if you're already in the first layer. So sort of like this uh, panic mode, if you like, that you know if you're not sure what layer you're in, you want to get back and make sure the board is in the first layer, but you definitely don't want to hit the space by. Uh, I have that set up as a leader key in Vim, so I don't actually often want to accidentally hit the space because it means the next key I press could do something chaotic in Vim. Um, so I'd, I want to try and avoid that. So all I have to do in that case is a double tap from the two thumbs. So right thumb, left thumb. That doesn't output anything, no matter which layer you're in. So if we're already in the second layer and we push it again, um, it actually doesn't do anything. It just takes us into an, into one of our additional layers. So again, from there, pushing the left thumb key will take us straight back to the home one. So it doesn't matter if we're already in another layer. When we push the right thumb key, it just means the next layer we're in will still have the left thumb key taking us back to home. Uh, so that works fine. If you're in the first layer, you go into the second layer and then back out again. Again, not firing anything out of the keyboard, but you end up with the keyboard in that first layer again. So we've actually added even more power to this left thumb key by uh, giving it the meh command when you hold it down. So it's space on tap and the meh when you hold it down. So if you hold it down and then hit a letter key, I use that with keyboard maestro on the Mac to give me application switching shortcuts. That's a massive uh, workflow improvement over using command tab, uh, which you can actually still do on this layout. So the right thumb key takes us into our second layer. And from that layer, we can then access the other two layers that we have available to us. So one of those is on the pinky and the other is actually just hitting the thumb key again. So two taps on the thumb key from our home primary layer will take us into our number layer. So we've got a numpad arrangement under my right hand, some media controls on the left, and some extra symbols associated with the numpad that are useful in this layer, as well as a dedicated command key here for, for doing things like command and the number shortcuts. So if we were back on our second layer again after just hitting the thumb key once, we could access the other layer with the pinky. That takes us into our sort of mouse mode and arrow key layer. So we've got our arrow keys and mouse controls on this one. So I can operate the mouse completely from this layer, uh, sort of WASD positioning for the left hand for the mouse cursor position and clicking with the right. And on the home row on the right hand, we've got arrow keys. Above that, we've got some extra shortcuts for navigating uh, browser tabs and browser history, which is particularly handy because those are pretty awkward keyboard shortcuts normally. Um, so just boom, boom to get into that layer. And then I can just tap those to switch between tabs and then back with the left thumb key to take me back home. You get used to that surprisingly quickly. It's sort of you just roll around the keyboard through these layers. There's no holding, there's no combos, it's just sort of and you're switching between the layers and coming in and coming out and you do kind of keep up with that but for when you don't keep up with which layer you're in you've got these repeatable mechanisms like the double thumb tap which will just bring you back home without outputting anything so you can rely on those as the fallback but generally if you if you're kind of focused you can kind of keep up with where the board is which layer you're in and particularly useful with the symbol layer which is the first one on the right thumb uh, you know you can do it's quite up for doing when you're programming you you output a lot of symbols all in one go uh, you know if you're writing a bit of javascript you've got the dollars and the brackets and the quote marks, you can just do all of that in the layer two without holding anything down. And then you can just jump out back to layer one with your left thumb. So in, in all of these layers, we've got a few additional functions that use tap dance uh, you know, on hold. So you can hold down a key in those layers and you get a different key, uh, just kind of an overflow really for, for less frequently used things that we can't really fit anywhere on a layer. We don't want to use a primary function on a layer. So I hope that's been an interesting look at how we, how you can actually live with a 34 key layout. It's not too crazy. You know, you've just got these basic mechanisms. If you get your layers clear in your head as to how you want to switch between them, you come up with these repeatable ways to know which layer you're in. I think it's it's a good thing to do to try and avoid holding down switches to keep it in layers. Um, it means you, you can access those thumb keys in the layer as well. So you get extra keys to use by doing this. Uh, particularly with the double tap, you know, where you go from one layer into another, that's a useful thing to be able to do just in terms of simplifying, again, those mechanisms for changing layers when you haven't got that many keys to start with. Um, so that all works quite nicely. And you do learn this, uh, this you know, what it all does. It, it does become muscle memory. You haven't got to keep super engaged all the time. Um, and, I, you know, I was quite enjoying using this. Like I said, I'm now experimenting going even, even less because actually every time I've gone to fewer keys, I've found it beneficial. It's not actually got to the point where I'm feeling 
feeling like I'm working too hard to figure it out. It's always been an overall benefit, but obviously you, I think there is a case to doing it slowly. I don't think you'd want to go straight from a full-sized keyboard down to a 24 key layout. Um, it would be too much at once, but if you do it bit by bit, you can kind of learn the thing and you don't lose your productivity while you're making the transition. So it's interesting to look at what kind of things you do at certain size layouts. So hopefully that's been of interest. Uh, if you click my name below, you can see all the other videos I've done. I've done loads of, of keyboard videos and hopefully you'll agree it's worth subscribing and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Stop.